acoustic singing. <laughs> it's really good, really good. There was a there was a new element right in this part <laughs> of the. Was that Ruth? Was that, Ruth was Ruth is uh, visiting us for the first time today, and I was sitting over, standing over here, and I think, that is awesome. That is <laughs> so good recruiting, Mary Lou. Good. <laughs> So be sure to say hi to, to Ruth when you have the chance. Um, you all showed up today because of the uh, uh, air conditioning advertising, didn't you? Yeah. I, I wrote out a text message and sent it out this morning saying that uh, it's supposed to be 115 out again today, I think. Yesterday was. Actually, I, I drove in from Reading back out to Palisadro, and my temperature on my car said 117 outside over there by uh, Silver Bridge, so, ooh, out. No, still water, still water. Take your Bibles. Let's turn over to uh, Romans chapter 16 this morning. Romans 16. If you think that you sometimes struggle with names, uh, this is a passage that probably most of us would struggle with. Paul mentions uh, 27 different individuals by name in this passage, and some of them are tough. So forgive me if you don't think that I pronounce one or two exactly right, as maybe you would. So, but uh, <coughs> Romans chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 1 through 16 this morning. We're getting ever closer to the end of this incredible epistle, and. Uh, I think once we finish this, I'm going to do a number of psalms coming up here, hopefully. Well, thank you. Thank you. Psalms, uh, you know, maybe call them summer psalms, so we're going to do a handful of psalms coming up, take us into the fall. So Romans chapter 1, I mean Romans chapter 16, I'm sorry, verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church which is at Chentrea that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever ma matter she may have need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my sake, or for my life, risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. Greet Epinatus, my beloved, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. Greet Mary, that's an easy one, <laughs> who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are outstanding among the apostles, who also were in Christ Jesus before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus our fellow worker in Christ, and Statius, my beloved. Greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Trephena and Trephosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Greet a Syncritus and Phaligon and Hermes and Petrobus and Hermas and the brethren with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Paul had a way with remembering names, didn't he? <coughs> I always remember I, I rode my bicycle in 1981, I think it was, I rode my bicycle from uh, Carson City over to Reading and uh, got over here. And my aunt took me to church one Sunday over at North Valley Baptist Church, and I met uh, Pastor Blue as I was walking out of the church, and we shook hands, and I told him my name. Well, we didn't see each other for another year or so. And then I showed up to go to Shasta Bible College, and I was walking on the campus one day, and he walks right up to me. Barry, good to see you again. It's like, you're kidding me. You remember my name? 
Well, Paul was that kind of gay, g- guy. If we ever, we ever think that Paul was a, an impersonal guy uh, who really didn't love people, he did. He loved people. He remembered their names. Well, before we dive into this, let's look to the Lord one more time in prayer. Lord, help me. Pray that just by your spirit, as I've been praying, Lord, that you would give utterance to my mouth. Lord, help me to just fill me with your spirit. Guide us by your spirit in in hearing your word and applying your word this morning. Oh, how we need you. We desperately need you to work in our lives to cause us to grow. Lord, you're the one who waters. You're the one that the sun shines down on us in faith. You're the one who causes us to grow. And we pray that you would cause us all to grow in your faith today, the faith that you give. And we'll honor and glorify you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm sure that all of you... All of us here are well aware of the explosion in what we we would refer to as social networking platforms over the last 20 or so years, right? Just just an explosion. And I can just name some of the names. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok. (laughs) I mean, some of, these, some of the names are very interesting. Now, now take Facebook, for, inter, you know, for example. As we, most of us know, Mark Zuckerberg from a Harvard dorm room in February of 19, you know, 2004 launched Facebook. And, and by December of that same year, there were already a million followers, users of, of Facebook. Three years later, uh, there were 100 million users of Facebook. Do you know how many users there are of Facebook today? Amen. 2.8 billion people. No wonder, no wonder they can control so many things. Um, it's, almost, it's, it's not going to be long before they'll be closing in on half the world's population as far as how many people. And even though I don't, personally, I don't tap into Facebook nor any other social networking platform. I just don't. I, I just probably enjoy my anonymity too much. And it's okay. I, I don't begrudge anyone here being on Facebook or Instagram or any of that. Um, but I, w- I, w- I was astounded this last week just to, to just do some research on some of the statistics as far as how many followers certain people have. Now, technically, from what I understand, the most friends that a person can have is 5,000. So, <laughs> anyone here have 5,000 friends? Well, but... Take, for example, you know, some, some people have so many followers. Cristiano, Cristiano Ronaldo, the soccer player, he has 149 million followers. Um, Mr. Bean, that quirky fellow, has 126 million people. Uh, the actors, Will Smith and Vin Diesel, have 108 million and 107 million, respectively. And the singers, um, Taylor Swift and Adele, have 76 million and 67 million, respectively. Adele is really lagging behind. <laughs> my wife had got called into work today, so I can say this. I can say, even my wife has 400 friends <laughs> on Facebook. I mean, I wish I had 400 friends. For all of uh, Facebook's pluses, I, I, I do have my concerns, probably many concerns. But one concern is, I wonder how much our current social networking craze uh, has to do not so much with the kind of desire for recognition uh, from people of really doing something significant, like finding a, can- you know, a cure for cancer and having a bunch of followers. But today... It's just the desire for mere recognition. Tom Patton says this in his book, 
right thinking in a world gone wrong. He says, quote, where fame was once the recognition of exceptional accomplishment, it has now been replaced by celebrity, the less dignified notion of recognition for simply being recognizable. That's where we're at today. One of the downsides of this is what, you know, in another, another article that I read, an AP article, which was entitled Facebook Depression in Teens. And it says this, it says, within your face friends tallies, status updates, and photos of happy people looking happy, having great times, Facebook pages can make some kids feel even worse if they think that they don't measure up. I don't have, I don't have as many friends as Joey. Right? So what shall we say to our culture's celebrity craze? Well, we could say many things. For the most part, it just seems to be another symptom of our, you know, man's fallenness in many ways. Um, but with that said, I think one of the real downsides of it today is that there, you know, with such a shallow focus just on recognition, um, people today really don't recognize what is truly valuable. Godly service, godliness, having a relationship with Christ, people sacrificing their lives on the mission field, and so forth. For example, I wonder, you know, how many people would, you know, if we transported ourselves back 100, 200, 300 years, and if Facebook existed then, how many people would be, really be interested in someone like William Carey? William Carey, who left his shoe repair business in England, traveled halfway around the world with his wife, and for the first seven years of his ministry there, didn't see a single convert. How many people would be interested in that? Even Kerry re referred to himself as a plotter, uh, you know, translating the scriptures. I wonder how many people would also be interested in someone like David Brainerd. David Brainerd, who at the, at the time was coughing up blood on a daily basis because he was dying of tuberculosis, because he was trying to reach the, 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 the natives that lived along the border of colonial America with the gospel. And he, he ended up dying an untimely death of, of age 29. How many people would, how many Facebook followers would he have? Or someone like Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael was just an amazing young woman who suffered from neuralgia. And that was a, a disease of the nerves that, that just caused just incredible pain. And it oftentimes left her bedridden for the last couple decades of her life were pretty much spent in a bed. And anyway, that didn't stop Amy from becoming a missionary to India. And besides writing, being a prolific writer, she had an amazing ministry outreach to young women who had been co-opted into prostitution. And... Uh, on one occasion, she wrote back to someone who asked her, what is missionary life like? And Amy responded, missionary life is simply a chance to die. How many Facebook followers would Amy have? In many ways, you know, such individuals as that really put our culture to shame in so many ways. Uh, they are dedicated believers that really fit the description of Hebrews chapter 11, 28, which says, people of whom the world was not worthy. Well, what is the cure? What is the remedy to our culture's craze? I don't think it's so much to, to not recognize people at all, but it is to get back to, to recognizing what is truly valuable, recognizing godly service, living for Christ, giving yourself up for others, recognizing things like that. I think that that's really where, he, where it should be. And that's, that's a big part of the reason why I read Christian bi biographies and why I think you should too. They're so beneficial. And you might say, well, what does this have to do with Romans chapter 16? Well, it has everything to, to do with Romans chapter six, 16. As Paul nears the end of this great epistle, he highlights 27 individuals here in verses 1 through 16 27 individuals for the, the church at Rome to take note of, to pay attention to, to, to affirm, to, to applaud, if you will. Remember in our last two installments out of Romans, we, we focused upon 
uh, Paul's example of being a fruitful Christian. Here in these, this passage, verses 1 through 16, we see a number of examples of fruitful Christians. Right? And as Paul draws our, our attention to these individuals, we can be sure that he wants us to be inspired by their example, to, to, to follow their example. Now, time doesn't permit us to go over all 27. I know so, some of you just were, you were thinking about that, weren't you? Thinking, Is he going to try to comment on all 27? No, I'm not going to try to. But I want to highlight and bring to your attention five of them. Three individuals, one couple. Total of five individuals. Real people serving a real risen Christ in a real fallen world. And the first of them is right, the one that Paul mentions right off the bat is Phoebe. You can see Phoebe. Let's just reread verses 1 and 2. And I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Chantrea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. I mean, there's, there's enough material right there in those two verses to preach a whole sermon just on Phoebe, to focus on her. Um, she was just, that, and it seems that Phoebe most likely was a single gal due to the lack of any mention of a husband there. I, I think that we can say that she was probably a single gal. And whether she was a widow or whether she was a lifelong single, we don't know. But what is clear in these verses is that she was a woman of apparent financial means. How can we see that? The word translated helper in verse 2, you see it there, has the idea of patron or benefactor. In fact, uh, Kenneth Weiss, the New Testament expert, Greek language expert, he says this. He says, has the idea, a woman set over others, a protectress, a patroness, caring for the affairs of others and aiding them with her own resources. Maybe she was a businesswoman like Lydia. Remember, Lydia was a seller of purple a woman of financial means. We just don't know where she came to have her resources. We don't know. What we do know is that from her resources, she ministered to others and sought to see the increase of the gospel. This reminds me of the godly lady Huntington, who is known as Selena Hastings. And Selena lived during the 18th century. And after she had mothered seven children, and her husband died, and she had a, a fortune, uh, we're, we're told in history that she became a huge supporter of the ministries of such godly men as George Whitfield and John Wesley. And she was just a financial backer of those ministries. Those, they wouldn't have been able to do what they did if, if it wasn't for Selena, the orphanage in Georgia that George Whitfield got going. She was a supporter of that. There's a huge amount of good that can be done by those who are financially blessed of the Lord. Right? Now, what seems also to be the case of Phoebe, as Paul indicates here, is that uh, Paul apparently sent the epistle that he wrote via Phoebe's hand to the church at Rome. Now, remember, Paul is where? He's at Corinth. He's at Corinth at the time of the writing of this, this epistle. Uh, Phoebe herself is from Chantrea, which is a port city not far away, about maybe seven miles away from Corinth. And, and, and he sends this epistle via her hand to the church there. Now just stop and think about that for a second. She was carrying this most significant letter from the great apostle Paul. Just consider the trust and the confidence that Paul had invested within this single gal. One commentator that I read said this, Phoebe carried under the folds of her robe the whole future of Christian theology. That's amazing. He also describes her uh, as a servant of the church, which is at Chantrea. The, the word that is used there is the feminine version of deaconess. Uh, she, she may have been a deaconess. My own opinion is that based upon the qualifications for deacon that Paul sets forth in 1 Timothy, I don't think that she probably was, but that she was just known for being a servant of the church. But she wasn't necessarily an office holder 
there within the church. But just let's just stop and apply this for a second. I mean, what an affirmation of women. Is it not, once again? You know, we live, and, and all the more we're hearing just the, 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 the emphasis upon, you know, defending the defenseless, equal rights, women being advanced, and, and all, for, you know, all good things. Uh, but in the, New, in the New Testament, if we want to look for where there was more, you know, where there was such an incredible affirmation of women, it's in the Bible. Some of Jesus' closest followers were women, right? Women who helped support Jesus in his ministry. Um, we also see, you know, what, how, how Phoebe ought to inspire not only all Christian women in general, but, but single Christian women in particular. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 33, Paul says that a married person is concerned about the things of the world, how they may please their spouse. Any of you married women here know that, what, that, what that's like with your husband, right? How much attention you have to give to that guy. <laughs> Cooking and cleaning. When you're single, you don't have a, a guy that you have to take care of. and Give yourself more to ministry. I'd also say this, what... I think Pastor Keith and I would both be on the same page here that we would view that office holders within the life of the church, elders, pastors, and, and deacons, and that that's, those are offices particularly for men. It doesn't mean that women cannot fulfill just incredible roles of service within the life of the church. And they should, right? Um, one last thing I might comment here is that she was from this, uh, this town called Chentre. About Again, it was a port city about, about seven miles away from Corinth. And, and, you, and you know what's true about most port cities of that day and age, and even in our day, they're places of vice, play, play, you know, places of corruption. Sailors come in, and what are the kinds of things that they want to do? That's the kind of town she was from. But again, it shows the long reach of the gracious arm of God that he can save anybody at any time, anywhere. He can save someone like me from Carson City, Nevada. You know, gambling town. Prostitution out seven miles away, outside of the town of Carson City. He can save anybody. Right? Phoebe, just what an example. Not only Phoebe, but, you know, turning our attention away from Phoebe, the single adult, Paul mentions this married couple. Prisca and Aquila. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in the Lord Christ Jesus, who for my sake risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of Christ, uh, churches of the Gentiles, and also greet the church that is in their house. Married couple, by the way, Prisca is simply the formal name of the gal that we also know her as Priscilla. Priscilla is simply the diminutive of that same name. It's like, you know, if a guy's name is William. People call him Bill or Billy, right? That's the diminutive of my dad's name was James. He, he, was, also, he was known as Jim or Jimmy. Same thing with, with Prisca here. She, she's Prisca, but people also referred to her. Luke referred to her in the book of Acts as Priscilla. I think Luke was very close friends with both Prisca and, and, and Aquila. Well, what might, what might we say of this couple here in this passage that ought to inspire us? Well, one thing is that they were incredibly hard workers. They were hard workers. Paul, Paul indicates here that they were, um, well, in fact, let me have you turn over to Acts chapter 18. First time that they are named within the New Testament is found in Acts chapter 18. And Luke tells us this. So Paul is on his way to Corinth. He was at Athens. Verse 1, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus. Pontus, just below the Black Sea, over Asia Minor area, right? Pontus, having recently come from Italy, actually came from Rome, with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, Claudius the emperor, commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he came to them, Paul came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were what? Tent makers, okay? They were tent makers. Now, tent making in that day, 
was an arduous, very labor-intensive kind of, of a hand thing, right? Where, which involved long, tedious hours, where with sharp blades, they would cut leather. Well, I don't think they had canvas. They didn't have canvas like we do in our day. Most of those tents were made out of leather. We, they would cut leather with sharp blades. They would have to punch holes in it with awls. They had to, had to sew it together with thin strips of leather. So it was just tedious, hard work. Together with Paul, they worked hard hours. By the way, again, this is where we get that, that designation, a tent-making ministry, right? Sometimes you hear of someone being off in Turkey or, or wherever, and they have a, they're, they're a tent-maker ministry. That means that they're, they're working a side occupation in order to fund doing gospel ministry. That's a tent-making ministry. So th this couple was a hard-working couple together with the Apostle Paul. We also see that they were on the move for Christ. They were, they were flexible. Um, we saw there within the book of Acts that, that Aquila was from Pontus, where we described. And then we find them at Corinth after they had been at Rome or in Italy. And they were displaced from there. And so they came to Corinth. They met up with Paul there. The next time that we see them in Scripture, in Acts chapter 18, verses 18 through 19, is that they were at Ephesus. So they've been to Pontus, they've been to Rome, they've been to Corinth, they've been to Ephesus. And, and all the while, they have a house church meeting in their house. And Scripture ends up in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 19, that they were back at Ephesus. Listen to what John Piper said of them regarding this. He said, so from the little that we know, they lived in Pontus, Rome, Corinth, Ephesus, Rome, Ephesus. That's not an easy life, he says. Just a good one. Sojourners, exiles, following Christ. And everywhere they are, it seems, they had a church in their house. They were movers with Christ. And that's a challenge to all of us, I think. Wherever we're at, wherever we live, to be serving the Lord. To be working hard, serving the Lord. Ministering to God's people. You don't necessarily have to have a house church meeting in your home, but we can all certainly have people over to our house for a meal or for fellowship, getting to know you, right? What an example we see from those two. I always remember my, my, my mentor, Ed Peterson, down at Anderson Cottonwood Neighborhood Church. Ed and his wife, Nadine. Nadine, every Sunday, would have, she would put a turkey in the roaster. She put a turkey in the oven. And so that by the time they got home from church, the turkey would be done. It was always funny to watch them as a couple because they each went around inviting different people over to their house for lunch afterwards, and neither one knew who that they invited. <laughs> and they, right, sometimes they would have, you know, 20, 30 people show up for lunch after church. Priscilla and Aquila. Another thing about Priscilla and Aquila we see here is that they were, risk they were risk takers for Christ. Paul says that they risked their necks for his life. Literally, Paul says, they placed their necks under. That's what the Greek literally says. They placed their necks under. They, they placed their necks under what? Well, the potential for execution from a Roman sword. That's what they placed their necks under, most likely. When and where and how many times that they actually did that, we don't know. What we do know is that in their identification with the gospel, in their identification with Christ, they put themselves in potential harm's way. They were willing, they were willing to suffer the loss of their own lives for the sake of the advancement of the gospel, for the sake of Christ. As the writer of Hebrews puts it, they didn't consider their earthly lives as dear unto themselves, but they knew that they had a better and more lasting possession. And thus they served the Lord. I mean, what, a, what an example for us to follow. They were hard workers. They were movers for the sake of Christ. They were risk takers. Now, before I, before I mention this, third, this other individual, this brings us to our fourth individual here within this passage. I, I want you to turn over to Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, just for a moment. Philippians chapter 4, verse 22. 
Now again, just a little bit of chronology here, where Paul wrote this epistle from. Remember, he wrote Romans from where? Corinth. He wrote it from Corinth, and he's eventually, he's trying to make his way to Jerusalem to bring this love offering that he's been building, gathering up to the, to the brethren there in, in Israel, right? And when he goes there, he's going to get arrested. He's going to spend two years at Caesarea. He's eventually going to be shipped to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. Now, while he's, when he gets to that point where he's under house arrest in Rome, he never stops ministering. He keeps writing to believers, and, and that's where we get our prison epistles from, right? Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, they were all written by, by Paul at Rome, okay? Brings us to chapter 4, verse 22 of Philippians. Notice this. Paul simply says, verse 21, greet every saint in Christ Jesus, the brethren who are with me greet you. Those who are at Rome, right? All the saints greet you, notice it, especially those of Caesar's household. Wow. He's, he's under house arrest, and he says, especially those of Caesar's household greet you. Hmm. So what that tells us is that the gospel had penetrated into the very halls of that world power. Now, here's, here's a very probable connection with what Paul says there and to the individual that Paul mentions in verse 8. Coming back to Romans chapter 16, verse 8, Paul says, Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. And you say, well, what does Ampliatus have to do with Caesar's household? Well, Ampliatus was a very common name among slaves. Most likely a slave. I think very likely Ampliatus was a slave. Now what's interesting is that in one of the earliest, that is a, a first century Christian catacomb near Rome. Do you know what a catacomb was? Catacomb was an underground cave tunnel place where Christians buried their dead in and around Rome. Oftentimes they didn't. They didn't cremate their dead, but they buried their dead subterranean. And the catacombs was one of the places where they did that, of course. And in this particular catacomb can still be found a beautifully decorated tomb bearing the name of Ampliatus. Very interesting. And this particular catacomb where this tomb of Ampliatus is found is called the Catacomb of Domatella. Now get this, Flavia Domitella was a Christian woman, and she was married to the consul Titus Flavius Clemens, who was a great nephew of the emperor Vespasian, who ruled just a, a couple years after Paul had been executed. Now here's the point. Here's the point. Domitilla could very well have been very close, and she probably was very close to Caesar's household. And she herself is a believer. And the Ampliatus, that is, you can presently see where the, his tomb is there, she, he very likely may have been a slave owned by Domitilla. And Paul refers to him as my beloved. Not just beloved, but my beloved Ampliatus. That's astounding. What an affirmation. What, a, what an, an expression of love to someone who is at the very bottom of the social ladder. Again, let's apply this. And again, it reminds us that within the church, within the, the church of Christ, lines of social ordering, you know, the ladder, you know, distinctions between the rich and poor, Gentiles and Jews, men and women, that within Christ's church there is a leveling where there's none of these things as far as a pecking order, so to speak. What matters is being a part of the family of God. Ampliatus was a, a part of the family of God. And it also shows us here, I think, that, that prominence within the church, distinction or praiseworthiness, is open to all. It's open to all as far as serving the Lord. 
Do you know that within the early church, I mean, it wasn't uncommon in the first and second century for a slave to literally be a pastor over a church. Wasn't uncommon. Some of Paul's closest associates were slaves or former slaves. Think about Onesimus, right? <laughs> Who was owned by Philemon. That's what the whole epistle of Philemon is about. Is that Paul is appealing to Philemon to release Onesimus. What a challenge. What, what, again, we, culturally, this is all the rage. This is all we're ta hearing talked about. You know, critical race theory and everything you know, on the news. It's big. But again, the Bible gives us the basis for just the leveling and the acceptance of one another. It doesn't matter whether we're black or white or Chinese, African, Native American. It doesn't matter. Accepting one another in Christ. One more person I want to draw to your attention to in verse 13. Paul says, Greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Now, when Paul refers to Rufus as a choice man in the Lord, he uses the word you know, for choice that is used elsewhere for elect. Rufus was an elect man, we might say. Um, and the point here is not so much an emphasis upon God's, in terms of salvation, God's sovereign grace. Election is certainly true of, of all believers uh, in general, right? It's, it's true of that. That's probably not Paul's point here. Most likely, Paul's point is to emphasize that Rufus was a, a choice Christian. He's an exemplary, exemplary Christian. He was a, a shining example of someone who served the Lord. That's probably his emphasis here. But there's much more than meets the eye. And now we come to what Paul Harvey used to refer to as <laughs> the rest of the story, right? To see the rest of the story, turn over to Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. Mark 15. Whereas Ampliatus, there might have been a, a little bit of a speculation or a whole lot of speculation that I just did on it. There's none here. This is very clear. This is very clear. I want you to see something. Mark chapter 15. And you, you remember the setting. Our Lord, our Lord has been mocked. He's been uh, spat upon. He has been scourged. Roman scourge, that means that with a, the cat of, the Roman cat of whip had metal and bone in it tore into the back of our Lord Jesus Christ. And many people at that time, you, you could die. It wasn't uncommon for someone to die when they were scourged. And so now Jesus is being led away to Mount Calvary. To the, he's being led away to be crucified. And he's trying to bear the cross member of his cross as he's carrying it along. Right? But he's weak. He's lost a lot of blood. And Mark tells us in verse 21, And they pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Serene, and here we go, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear the cross. Most likely, I mean, we got to ask the question. First of all, where was Mark at? Where was Mark when, where, and to whom is he writing this gospel? Who, what is the background to the Gospel of Mark? Well, most likely, Mark prepared his Gospel primarily for the Christians in Rome, the Christians in Italy, probably a, a, a short few years after Paul had been executed. That's to whom he's writing. John MacArthur says this. He says, Mark, Mark would have had no reason to include the names of Alexander and Rufus, Simon's sons, unless they were known to the church at large, or at least known to the church in Rome. Scholars therefore agree that the Rufus mentioned here by Paul was one of those sons of Simon, who may have been brought to saving faith in Christ through that contact with him, with Christ, on the way to Calvary. So picture this. This is how it all seemed to play out. A man named Simon from Serene, located in North Africa, roughly, you know, present-day, we're present-day Libya, 
is located. This man comes to Jerusalem to be there on the day of Passover. Maybe he was a Jew. Comes to be there on the day of Passover to worship the Lord. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know that our Lord Jesus is going to be crucified. He finds himself there, and he finds himself positioned providentially along the path, along the route our Lord was walking on when he's on his way to be crucified. And as he's there, he's pressed into service by the Roman soldiers to carry the Lord Jesus' cross, the cross member of the cross, because Jesus is too weak, right? Somewhere along the line, maybe it was just in his observation of our Lord and hearing the things that he sits, Jesus said, the way he behaved, maybe he, he was probably there when our Lord was crucified. He saw all of the events that occurred in that situation. Somewhere there, this guy gets converted. But not just Simon, but eventually his wife and two of his sons, Alexander and Rufus. What an amazing story, isn't it? Amazing grace. How shall we apply that to our lives? Well, one thing, one application would certainly be this. When, when our Lord Jesus redeems a person, quite often, sometimes more often than not, his plan is not just to save an individual, but his plan is to save a whole family, a whole group, right? That's his plan. There's probably a number of us here could testify how that the Lord saved them and then he saved their spouse and he saved their kids and then he saved the spouses of their kids. All of these things transpire through his redeeming grace in their life. Uh, perhaps there is also a particular application to those of us here who are dads. Who are dads. Because it appears that it was through Simon's interaction with our Lord that Simon got saved. And then Simon, he influences his wife and he influences his sons to the Lord. While a godly woman certainly has impact within her family, there is, there is an impact that we as dads are, are to have also upon our children, upon our grandchildren. Some of us here are grandpas. You're going to be a new grandpa, Luis. You can have an impact upon your grandchild. Right? Women can certainly have an impact within the life of their family. Men are, we're, we're called to have, we're, we're going to be more answerable to the Lord than our wives in many ways. So we need to be challenged by this. We need, um, first of all, you know, we got to ask ourselves, a question, are we a lover of Christ? Are we... Are we really given over to living our life for Christ? We've got to be challenged in that. Secondly, are we loving our wife the way that a, a Christian man is to love his wife? Are we a servant to her? Are we, a, are we affirming her? Are we building her up in the faith? And for our kids, are we, are we calling our kids to the Lord? Are we praying with them? Are we reading the scripture with them? Are, are, are we interacting with them about the Christian faith? I was with my, my daughters. Uh, you know, if, if I really wanted to engage them with them in, in discussion, we, I'd get talking with them about heaven and hell. And uh, they, they never wanted to go to sleep. You know, they wanted, didn't, well, they wanted to stay up talking. So we'd talk about that for, you know, long periods of time. Men, we need to be challenged. So, from these five individuals we talked about here today, we talked about Phoebe, we've talked about the married couple, we've talked about Prisca and Aquila, we've talked about Ampliatus, we've talked about Rufus. Somewhere in one of these individuals, you can identify. Can you not? We all can find one of them that we identify with, and we can be challenged by them. But who was the one that made all the dif difference in their life? Who was the one that changed their life? 
Look what Paul emphasized. Notice how many times in these verses, 1 through 16, that Paul mentions our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 3 mentions fellow workers in Christ. Verse 7, in Christ. Verse 8, in the Lord. Verse 9, in Christ. Verse 10, in Christ. And then in verses 11 through 12, three times he mentions in the Lord. So in all of these people, Paul, you think Paul's making a point there? Absolutely. These are not just good people. These are people whose lives were turned upside down by Christ. Who were granted repentance and faith, who turned away from their sin, whose lives were changed, who ended up living their life for our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, and they get put down, and might we call this Paul's Facebook page? <laughs> and isn't it amazing that for all of the era of the church, for all of the couple millennia since this was written, these individuals' names are written down here? Would your name be written down there? Would mine? Our names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, if we are believers. But will they also be written down in the Book of Memory for how that we lived our life during this age for the sake of Christ? Howard Hendricks was a beloved uh, professor at D D Denver, D Dallas Theological Seminary just one of the most beloved professors that was there. The students would refer to him as Howie, Howie Hendricks. I had the opportunity of listening to him speak at uh, the Oakland Coliseum for a Promise Keepers Conference. I believe it was about 1996 or so. And he issued a challenge within his, in, within his message for all of us guys. There were 50,000 guys there. 50,000 men singing the great hymns of the faith, holy, 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 and so forth. And I couldn't tell you what his exact message was that day, but I can tell you how he ended it. <laughs> He's not a very big guy, not very tall, but he got to the end of it, and he just looked at all of us, 50,000 men, and he said, go for it! And then he, he amped it up, Go for it! And then at the end, with everything in his might, from his toes, he just, 50,000 men, go for it! I think that that's how Paul would end to you and I today, is to go for it. To go for it in walking with Christ. Let's go ahead and stand. Uh, underneath your uh, chairs, there is our, our old song book. This song is not found in there, but if you turn over to page number four. We're just going to end singing Majesty. Margaret's going to help me out here. Page number four. Majesty, worship his majesty, unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne. Unto his own, his anthem raise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty. 
Worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. May the Lord bless you. Have a great day.